Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, this special event on the Lost and Found initiative with our guest of honor, Emile Alkali. <laughs> Woo! Um, so I want to thank the Kelly Writers House for hosting this event. Uh, Al Felris, as usual, always thanks. Um, Allie Katz, and of course, Jessica Lowenthal. Without her, not, none of this would be able to happen. And thank you for making the process easy as well. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be hosting this event, which is really a conversation with uh, Emil here, uh, who is a poet, a novelist, a translator, uh, a critic, an editor, a scholar, a professor, a mentor, a father. Uh, he wears many hats, sometimes wears none. Um, his books include uh, After Jews and Arabs, Memories of Our Future, Islanders, From the Warring Factions, and A Little History, and of course many more. Um, on the side, you know, just to pass the time, Emil teaches uh, <laughs> at uh, Queens College in the Graduate Center, CUNY. Um, recently, he was also uh, given a well-deserved honor, a major honor, a 2017 American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation for his work as founder and general editor of the Lost and Found uh, CUNY Poetics Document Initiative. This award uh, honors outstanding achievement and contributions to diversity in American literature and the recipients are chosen by other writers. So I think it's particularly significant. Um, and today it's mostly in that role, that is as founder and general editor of Lost and Found that we're gonna uh, be encountering uh, Emil, your earthly manifestation, um, which and it was founded in 2010, which I think he's gonna talk a bit more about that. I first learned about the uh, Lost and Found in 2013 at the exact moment I first met uh, Emil Alcalay. We'd been put on the same panel at a special symposium at Yale University called Beyond the Text. Um, the one conference I've gone to in 25 years. So. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was an event, it was a really cool event. Though. It, was, it brought together uh, cool. literary uh, historians, just regular historians, uh, archivists, right, which is rare, all in the, together in the same panel. Al was there too, uh, but he was talking about sound as usual, you know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so we got along right away. Uh, Mila and I, we bonded over our common appreciation of Jack Kerouac, uh, which often runs against the grain of most elitist strains of US <laughs> academe. And I remember we kind of just sat on a bench in New Haven and like <laughs> talked and talked and talked uh, about archives, about Kerouac, about uh, you know, the, the power of literature to kind of convey a, an emotional truth across time and space. Um, and speaking of which, this past summer, I don't know if you remember, but Emil sent me a precious document straight out of his own archive, which is an essay he wrote on Jack Kerouac when he was in Ice High School, right here. <laughs> um, see how lovingly he designed the cover here. Um, and this is from 1970, which means that you wrote this just uh, a year after he died, or months after months, he died? Yeah. Uh, at a time when he was largely out of print and really misunderstood. Um, now, I can't read the essay, but what I want to read to you guys is the afterword <laughs> of a 14-year-old Emil Alkali. Very because pissed I, off 14-year-old, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it actually tells us a lot about you know, who you were, who you became, and uh, your ethos as a poet and a, and a scholar. All right. <laughs> In writing this paper, I thought of using various approaches. After examining conventional approaches, I decided upon using an unconventional approach. <laughs> there may be flaws in my particular approach, but I believe it is more exciting than most conventional approaches. <laughs> also, there may be objections to my use of extended quotes. In most papers, the author's thoughts and ideas are usually just reworded by the writer of the paper and presented as such. My belief is this, why not let the author himself speak? He is perfectly able to do so. <laughs> the length of the paper may be objected to also, but I am writing about a very complex man and would write 25 or 35 more pages if I had the time. And finally, if this paper does not suit the teacher that is to read it, at all, all I can say is this. I did not write the paper to suit anybody's taste. It was written by me and for me. And if, <laughs> and if any teacher would like a paper to fit their taste, they should write it themselves. <laughs> it is written for me to be read by a teacher. <laughs> In May 28, 1970. <laughs> well, I haven't really changed my attitude particularly. 
so what we'll do, we'll just um, have a conversation. Emil's going to talk a bit about the project, and then I'll have some questions. We'll talk, and we'll ha also uh, leave time for questions from you guys. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be back. Uh, I've been here numerous times, and it's always a great place to come to. Um, I just want to anecdotally say when I met JC, uh, his uh, extraordinary work that he had done at Columbia as a grad student in finding the Claude McKay novel <laughs> was on the front page of the New York Times. Oh, yeah. This caused much ire amongst <laughs> us at CUNY because uh, one of my students had just discovered uh, a Muriel Rukeyser novel, uh, Savage Coast, that was written in 19... Oh, we're out there. <laughs> that was written in 1937 and was sitting in the Library of Congress in her archive wrapped in twine and had never been looked at again. So when, we, when I was going to this conference, I was all prepared to like, who is this guy from Columbia? What are you? And then we met and it all just melted. <laughs> um, oh, I never knew I had dodged one there. Yeah, but anyways, let me, uh, I want to read, I was asked very recently to write a brief manifesto for Lost and Found. So let me read that and uh, take off from there and just say a few things before sure. I get grilled. Um, this is going to appear in the Cambridge Literary Review in Cambridge, England. Um, and it's called Follow the Person, uh, which has been, and I'll say a little bit more about that, that has been one of our bedrock ideas. Follow the Person, a manifesto for Lost and Found. Everywhere we look, our history, history is distorted to the point of caricature. Morality tales told from the arrogant present. Everyone hurtling like lemmings in a headlong race to victimhood. Grander claims for and against without judgment or discrimination. Remember the root of each word, etymologies. Remember the wheat is poisoned. Why not? Why couldn't it? You mean it already happened? The buildings, the vaults, the climate-controlled rooms, no guarantee. Los fonografos nos llegaron los garones. Photographs have cut our throats, 1922. Screens dissect our ears. The materials must be handed over mouth to ear, hand to hand, in touch. The voice is all. But the Tigris, the Oriental Institute, just off Bascharchia, the films and photos and books of Palestine, the voices in Massachusetts and in Massachusetts, Apartments cleaned out and papers piled into dumpsters. Looted archives at the Hoover Institute, the fine lawns of Leland Stanford, Arabic, Farsi, Ottoman ashes whirling along the river, narrow river, narrow city, easily besieged. Have you thought about defense? Do you know where the exit doors are? How much you'd be able to carry before the flames lick at your synthetic clothes and you go up like a fireball? How much can you remember, like Farage's lines carried out of prison, grand recitals in the heads of his comrades. Do you even know what you'd want to save? No time, then, to choose. Not much time now, either. So, you know, my idea of Lost and Found uh, has been, you know, maybe on another level of urgency than might be displayed by the work itself. Uh, because, um, you know, there's been all this discourse around the archive now, and there, it presumes a stable, housed building that might last for a while. But that just is not the case. Uh, that simply is just not the case. And our archives will be destroyed at some point. Um, so the question is, what then do you, you know, how, how do you think about them? How do you work with them? How do you, how do you make them alive? You know, how do you make those repositories? How do you leave clues along the way that will give people some sense of what, of what actually is, is, is going on. And my contention has been, I'm, tr I'm academically trained like as a medievalist and in Middle East studies. And um, so when I started teaching contemporary, particularly American stuff, but also in the context of like global decolonization and, and other things, I realized that the graduate students that I was encountering who were particularly involved in contemporary things, they needed to confront some things that were, uh, that they didn't have a vocabulary to deal with, you know. They needed to 
get in less mediated situations. And so I started thinking about archival work. And my contention has been that the work of poets and writers of the 50s and 60s particularly presents a <clears throat> very um, almost unique uh, situation in which, for me, the best thought of that takes place in this in this culture happens in the in the communication between writers in that period because it 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 uh, with the administration of knowledge and the construction of universities and the Cold War and all of these things uh, the thought that occurs in letters and in journals and in uh, projects that people propose and in kinds of uh, works that are extra poetic or extra literary are, are really where the thought uh, is most potent and most vibrant and most interesting. And so I set out to try to explore some of that, you know, to try to at least begin building the parameters where that, where, where the basis of that work would start to have some, um, you know, some footing, you know, and traction. And, uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm kind of shocked and amazed that we're going into our ninth year. Uh, there's about 40 projects. We have the chapbook series, which is more or less annual. We have book series, which is called Lost and Found Elsewhere, which is a kind of affinity group of publishers that we present book projects to, and they give us our propaganda page uh, in which one then sees all the books in the series, but published by different publishers. So we work with City Lights, with the Feminist Press, with the University of New Mexico. We have a Diane de Prima book coming out with City Lights uh, in next year, and uh, a couple of other projects from the University of New Mexico that were lost and found projects, the journals of Philip Whalen and the uh, letters of John Wieners, which are both extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary works. And there's a bunch of other things in, in many, many other things. Uh, that there's, I can't even keep up with them, actually. But I just want to say, before we get a couple of things about the, the technical aspects of it, just what we had in mind when we started. CUNY is the biggest public university in the country, OK? And um, the Graduate Center is a strange kind of you know, apex of some weird pyramid that nobody can really contain. And um, one of the objectives of Lost and Found was that it be very public. And so our work is public, it's pedagogical, and it is trying to do two things at the same time. It's taking the students out of the institution, and it's bringing non-institutionalized writers into the institution. But having them leave with a bunch of students, OK? <laughs> so for instance, we've had these visiting fellows. And our first visiting fellow when we started was David Henderson. Uh, David Henderson, who's an old friend, who's one of the founders of the Umbra Arts Workshop, who wrote the kind of uh, one of the, the first definitive rock biography, his book on Jimi Hendrix, and is an extraordinary poet, but also happens to be encyclopedic in his knowledge of people and and uh, events of the period. And that proved to be a very wise choice because the number of events that ended up becoming inspired by David's presence, we did a, we did a 100th anniversary of Sun Ra, for instance, where we gathered um, extant living members of the band who came. Uh, we did a reunion of, of the Umbra uh, participants who, who are still alive. Um, and a whole bunch of things like that. And part of the whole idea of the project was also legacy, how, how to involve communities, how to involve heirs, families, some of whom may or may not know what they have, um, some of whom may need just logistical help in figuring out what to do with this material whether it's worth something monetarily, whether it's what, you know, what, what, how, how to go about this. So that has been part of, so part of the training that goes into this with the students is really not simply producing the text, but what, what are the, what are the, what are the responsibilities? What are the ethics of being in a context where you are becoming the conduit for these remains, you know, which are, which are tied to people 
which are tied very specifically <laughs> to people and uh, and so often the, the litmus test is how does the person react to you know to um, to a situation and how do they deal with it and how do they work with it and so we've done a lot of a lot of work in that area where we've managed to arrange things or managed to you know and 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 so part of that part part of doing that means that everything has to be done right uh, because we we want to maintain a trust you know with 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 uh, readers and with people who will encounter us so they're very complex projects they, each one is is very complex and I just want to add uh, before we go into this this we, we're starting just a new this isn't out yet these are proofs but I can pass it around it's very very cool we're starting something called lost and found now and then which are reactions to immediate events unfortunately usually these will be deaths uh, so we, we, the first one is for Cecil Taylor, and um, it is uh, an image that uh, an old friend Archie Rand, the painter, gave me, which was for a concert that uh, Max Roach and Cecil did at Columbia. And on the other side is Archie's eulogy for Cecil uh, that he delivered at the memorial. Um, and I'll just read the, you know, the statement here, lost and found now and then. Since the inception of Lost and Found in 2009, we have witnessed enormous losses in the wider community of affiliated writers and artists. A central part of our mission has been to connect younger scholars and researchers to the work and person of elders whose artistic world they inherit. As this world hurtles toward oblivion due to reliance on increasingly <coughs> fragile, unstable, and fragmented means of transmitting the record, Lost and Found now and then adds a new facet to the prism we are constructing, a place for tribute and immediate response as and when necessary. So I'm very happy that we got this off the ground because there's been so many instances when, you know, some, something has happened and I feel like there needs to be just an object that will help record that. So. So, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah. Great, well, I mean, you touched on a lot of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about. Um, one of the things you said reminded me of something that uh, you said recently also is that the writers we focus on were thinkers and activists and we're constantly looking for other material that they've worked on. Then you said writers have been narrowly construed and we want to publish things that people haven't thought about and that have been sitting there in your So you touched on this already, but can you explain a bit more what you mean by the way in which writers have been narrowly construed and how this project like this can help us? Well, for instance, one of the things, you know, one of the, we have, by the way, we, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff here. So <laughs> look at it and leave with it. Uh, so I don't have to carry it back. But uh, for instance, one of the projects we did uh, a couple of years ago was uh, uh, two chapbooks of material of, of Ted Jones. Now, Ted Jones, who was always thought of as the Black Beat, um, lived in lived in Timbuktu for a long time. He kind of we kind of left the U.S. at a certain point, and he spent his time between Europe and Africa. And um, he gathered a tremendous amount of material, and he traveled a lot in Africa. And he gathered a tremendous amount of material, and he wrote a kind of really like a kind of popular guide to Africa. It's called a black man's guide to Africa. And it's really like, you know, you get off the, the you get at the airport and you go here and here's a hotel and you go to this museum and you ought to check this out. Like a green book. Like a yeah. yeah. And and it's absolutely extraordinary. And I mean he had boxes and boxes and boxes of material, brochures, flyers, all kinds of things. But his concept there was well what you know, what what should people be looking for? You know, what and what what are they coming to this continent with? In terms of their expectations, in terms of their, you know, their their, uh, so that's an example of a thing that um, fills a, a an extraordinary gap, you know, because right. here you have this quite encyclopedic person who uh, has decided to collect these things in a certain way mm -hmm. and to present them in a certain way. Um, that's you know that's just one. I mean the next the next uh, in the next series we're doing. Uh, Diane de Prima's uh, notes on Shelley, and particularly on Prometheus, uh, which are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and we're doing it along with uh, excerpts from Julio Cortázar's book on Keats, which people generally don't know about in English. It's never been translated into English. Uh, it's an early book, and it was published posthumously. Um, 
there's just so many, you know, the work that we've done, the, the Langston Hughes uh, journals in Central Asia are, are absolutely extraordinary. I right. mean, these were misfiled in, in several archives um, because of the names. Uh, they were confused. They were, they were uh, uh, he was dealing with Uzbek people mainly. Mm. And uh, there are, uh, the student who worked on it, great, our students happened to know Uzbek. She's from, <laughs> from Afghanistan. And she was able to translate a lot of the poems that had been dedicated to Hughes by young poets that he met, many of whom were, were you know, were killed in the purges. And so she reconstructed a whole history of Central Asia in the 30s, where Langston Hughes also <laughs> took, fo took extensive photographs, which she compares to the propaganda photographs. And, wow. um, you know, he's meeting people from the Communist Party in Alabama who are working in cotton production. He's, you know, it just, it, it, it pre you know, th th some of that stuff about Hughes's trip have been known, but getting into these journals and mm -hmm. deciphering them and then presenting the photographs presents a whole different picture because he was very exacting. He was taking down vocabulary words. He was writing extensive notes about people he met. He was noting where he went, whom he saw, what the atmosphere was like, who was an official right. party rep, who wasn't, you know, and so on. He was just very attentive. Yeah. So it, it, it's really kind of crucial information. Yeah, and you won't get it otherwise. Another, another aspect I find, too, is because you mentioned how it's been misfiled is the work that often so many of these, you know, post-war writers and poets do is is teaching, right? And all of their teaching notes or their lecture notes that are often <laughs> either lost or you never get to see them, um, and that historically, you know, the archivists would often see that as very um, n not valuable and would either throw it away right. or make it impossible to keep it within the context of what's going on, and that's yet another way in which... Well, um, one of, for instance, we, in the last series, we've done th three teaching, uh, the Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and Tony Cade Bambara, with a lot of the material from their years at CUNY. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that that started was we had done a project on Adrian Rich's teaching materials a few years ago, and in her archive was an extraordinary paper by Tony Cade uh, about the Sikh summer workshop in 1968. And there were also papers by David Henderson and by a bunch of other people who were involved in that. And I, I was like, okay, this is the beginning of a much longer project. Uh, and that stuff was, again, you know, all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like it had to be kind of reunited uh, in various ways. And then it was supplemented with archival work in student newspapers of the time to see, try to figure out which students, you know, what the, all those, all those, all those poets wrote things for the student newspaper and then follow up on who the editors were, you know, just to kind of build that world. Yeah, that wider context that yeah. you often don't see. And so that you need correspondence to give you that wider context or in such a case like this where they, certain names appear and you never knew that these people um, not only knew each other, but maybe took classes with each other. Um, it, it creates these networks that were otherwise invisible, right? It's also very mysterious. I mean, I, I did a project myself on um, the poet Vincent Farini. Uh, Vincent Farini, whose uh, The Maximus Poems by Charles Olson begin as letters to Vincent Farini. Now, Vincent Farini happened to be a mentor of mine from the time I knew, he knew me from the time I was born, but he was also a mentor of mine, a poetry mentor from when I was a teenager. And going through his archive, you know, I mean, I knew Vincent, I thought I knew Vincent well, but like, no, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and what was uncovered in the archive was extraordinary because Vincent had been a, uh, he was from Lynn, Mass, and uh, his parents were Italian immigrants who worked in the shoe factories, and he worked at General Electric, and he was in the far-left electricians' union, and he was hounded by HUAC, and um, his, we came to the conclusion that he had destroyed all his correspondence up until 1948, uh, because there were letters from Vincent to other people that were earlier in other archives, uh, but none of, none, no letters to Vincent, mm. okay? So 
we realized he must have destroyed all this stuff because he didn't want to implicate his friends um, in, in what was going on with him and just reconstructed an extraordinary world uh, of, of, of um, you know, of, of 30s and 40s activism and politics through his, through his letters. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned, too, you talked about going in contact with families, with estates, and then you just said that even though you, he's known you since you were born, what you knew about him was nothing compared to what you suddenly discovered. And have you experienced where when you contact the family or heirs and the state, they, they themselves didn't know much about their, their family member, and then it opens up a whole new dimension and maybe some stories about it. Because w any student who's working with the stuff that's still in copyright, you're going to have to you know, sure. approach an estate. And it, sure. it is a very human encounter. It actually reminds you that the scholarship you're doing, <laughs> it, it imposes back that humanity. There's Absolutely. a human being in front of you, and it represents the remains, as you said, you know, the, the life of the dead. Um, so it changes your, your, the ethics of the encounter. Absolutely. Well, it was interesting, you know, of all, of all people, um, a tremendous appreciation from uh, Gregory Corso's daughter, who didn't even know she was his daughter until later in life, uh, for the transcriptions of these two unbelievable lectures that he gave, which are like, you know, Gregory's history of the world from, you know, the beginning of the cosmos to yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, the erudition there is actually quite unbelievable mm. because when he wasn't, you know, getting high, he was looking at art and thinking about things and, and you know, and looking at archaeological sites and, and reading. And um, so that's an instance like that. I mean, that's a hard question because, there you know, th there's so many interstices here. For instance, um, when we approach the when we were doing the Adrian Rich project, Adrian Rich's archive is closed basically for 50 years and she doesn't, had, doesn't want a biography written, did not want a biography written. And uh, that has to do with, you know, family circumstances and things that happened um, and I guess some sense of protection to her children. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got, I threw a friend who said, oh, Pablo lives in my building. That's his her, her son. Uh, I said, great. So let me. So I got in touch with him, and we talked, you know, intermittently over a period of several months. He said, because right after she died, he, you know, something happened statewide that really disturbed him and his brother. And he said, we're really like, you know, this is hard for us. And so, but then, you know, he said, oh, CUNY and teaching, and he just like loved the idea and. Mm became a real champion of it and ended up speaking at our launch. And then at a certain point, he said, I'm really having trouble with this, art, you know, with this estate business. And do you have anybody who can help me? So who do I get? I got Bill Rukeyser, Muriel Rukeyser's son, who said, I'd love to help, help him, you know. Wow. So, you know, just this wonderful kind of connection there took place. And, uh, and he was very experienced because he had really been dealing with his mother's archive. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and was quite adept at what, what he was doing. So it was a real Yeah, I mean, the literary papers are a subset of personal papers. I think that's a good way to remember how private some of this material can be. And, of course, families might, you know, be hesitant to have all that released or some of it. And uh, anything that's, you know, financial, usually there's always, like, a restricted, you know, red folder file for, for a few years. And so mm -hmm. you want to make sure that it's being done in, in the right way. Did you ever encounter some, a project that you really was hoping was going to happen, but because of uh, copyright or a state law, it just didn't happen? You don't have to name names. No, you know, actually, amazingly, not yet. Hmm. We're good, you know, like, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, there's been some, you know, there's been some, um, some things that have been negotiations. delicate negotiations. But no, no, it's been, uh, yeah, it, it has it, it actually no, we haven't. That's we great. Haven't. Yeah, um, and that that involves you know that involves thinking through. I mean, the projects get initiated in different ways. You know, sometimes it's just the enthusiasm of a student, or you know, now we've we've happily actually um, moved out of the English department in some way, uh, uh, and a lot of the, we, we've managed to get um, we've managed to get uh, 
stipends from the provost's office for summer research for students. So anybody, any any grad student can apply. So we've had we've got a lot of people now from art history, from urban education. We have a guy working on the pedagogical um, kind of mm, practices of the Black Panther Party, which is really interesting. And he's tracing some, practices of Black Panther. yeah. And nice. he's kind of tracing some of the things, uh, you know, the writings in 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 the in the party paper, but also looking at things that actually happened on site, you know, through interviews and and so on. Uh, there's there's just a whole host well, of, of people actually, doing different uh, things you about know. student involvement. Yeah, at, with Lost and Found, like how because it's very student oriented and it's built with. So how how the students get involved and how, like, what's the mentoring relation there? What uh, if and what are their roles? Because like, they have very very important roles in the making of these and yep. editorships, right? And uh, yep. the from transcribing to digging to talking to all that work. So I think it's a great project, especially they, for that. you know they all work a little differently. We've tried to codify certain things and it just it doesn't work mm. in the end. I mean, we've tried to we've codified certain practices, you know, and we have a a large uh, back cadre of people of pre of editors who who are very mm. experienced. And we so who, yeah, who who will help and actually in some cases we've given them stipends to be mentors. Mm. Um, and 